Uh, our flag salute this morning is going to be led by Supervisor Holmes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Supervisor Holmes. Ann, would you please read the meeting procedures? Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, November 17th, 2009. Agendas are available on the wall outside this meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. There is a three-minute time limit per speaker. The Board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. When you speak, clearly state your name and address for the record. All items on the agenda will be open for the public to address before final action is taken. There is a three-minute time limit per speaker, which will be monitored by a timer on the podium. If there is a person speaking on behalf of a group with no other testimony from another member of the group, please identify yourself as such and your time may be extended at the pleasure of the Board. Keep in mind that the Chairman has the discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. It is requested that all pagers and cell phones be either turned off or put in the silent mode. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, Ann. And again, welcome this morning. This is a, a great day to gather and, and uh, you know, remember, you know, it, Salute what you folks have done and the amount of years that you have, have served the county and the citizens of Placer County, and we really appreciate it and we're glad you're here. We'll now start off with public comment. Anybody wishing to comment on any item that is not on our agenda today and it is in our purview? Please come forward. We'd like to have your name and address, please. It's Rebecca Delmeyer, and my address is 6165 Hillcrest Court, Forest Hill, California. Um, I, the reason I'm here today is uh, my husband is a deputy sheriff with Placer County and has been for 19 years, um, 30 years as a police officer. I'm very proud of him. Um, and there was just two requests that I would like to ask the board um, to consider. Um, currently, when our deputies retire, if they have sick leave or vacation accrued, they're requested to cash that out. Um, and they're not able to roll that into their 457-401 accounts. Um, if you're ranked lieutenant and above, you are allowed to do that. And if you're a correctional officer for the jail, I believe no matter your ranking, you can at least roll your sick leave. So I'm requesting um, that you would consider that for our deputies. It's about a 40% um, tax consequence to us if we're not allowed to roll that into our 457-401. I'm really nervous. My heart's pounding. <laughs> That's how you're doing fine. Um, the second request is um, when you currently impose the contract, there were several cuts made, and we understand, as I'm sure all of you do, that cuts have to be made and respect that. Um, however, one of the cuts was uh, reducing wellness um, from 5% to 2.5% of their base salaries. And for the deputies, which my husband is one of these deputies, he will be retiring in February of 2010. Retiring in the next year, that affects our retirement for the rest of my life. And personally, I plan on living a few more years. <laughs> um, I think for my husband, it costs about $132 a month. That would be cost to you to take that back to the 5%. And for us in retirement, it costs us about $100 a month for the rest of my life due to how we're going to choose to receive our retirement account. So I'm just asking you if you would take a look at those issues, um, see if there's anything um, you can do to help us out in those areas. It would be greatly appreciated. So, and we're, we're going to do that, and we're going to continue to try to work with the Deputy Sheriff's Association to resolve some of those issues. Okay, I appreciate it very much. Thank you Thank for you. your time. Right. Thank you for your husband's service. That's why I'm here. Hey, it's Mandarin time. I'm Joanne Neft um, uh, from Auburn, California. Um, and I'm sure 
probably all of you know that uh, 16 years ago, um, I was one of the founding people along with the Newcastle Area Business Association that started the, the Mandarin Festival in Newcastle. The Mandarin Festival is coming up this weekend, the 20th, 21st, 22nd. Um, Mandarins are ready to buy. Uh, when we started the festival, we had seven orchards in Placer County. We have now over 70 orchards in Placer County. So it's a thriving uh, agriculture effort in Placer County. I'm giving these to you. You can have them for lunch. And there are some free tickets or free admission tickets. I left some out on the desk in the front, but I also put some in your office. So if you want to come, Rocky, I know I always see you there, and I always see you there. I pick up one of those free tickets. It's free admission. Actually, I, I appreciate the free ticket, but I actually like donating to it because it's such a wonderful thing to go to. Well, aren't you a nice guy? <laughs> Thank no, you. I just, I just really enjoyed it. It was two years ago or a year ago my daughter from Alabama was here. And they loved it. If, they'd come every year if they could afford to fly here from Alabama. You know, Rocky, it's one of the things. It's really community. It's it's really a community event, it's and that's packed. what make and it's packed. Last year we had almost forty thousand people. That's it's a wonderful. I event. stood at the gate and almost cried. In fact, I think I did. Wow. <laughs> so because well, it's, it's successful and it's good. Thank you for what uh, you do. Thanks, Rocky. Uh, Rocky, I have yes. I'm sorry. First of all, I want to let everybody know that I had three mandarins this morning, and they're just perfect this year. Thank That's you. That's why you're so sharp this morning. That's why I'm on top of my game. And, <laughs> and did you get, so you got your synephrine. That's right. Yeah, I have, you know, you listen to my voice. Uh, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, it's my understanding that you're writing a cookbook for, with locally grown products. Uh, can you? Oh. Speak about that just for a minute. Just for a minute. I, I am writing a cookbook. <laughs> I'm writing a cookbook for those of you who don't know about it. I'm writing a cookbook based on all Placer County agriculture. We are cooking a meal every Monday through the year 2009. We invite four to six people to come and join us at the table so we can write recipes for eight people. We um, last night was our 46th dinner. Uh, which means we only have six more to go. <laughs> Our cookbook is, uh, the last night is uh, December 28th. Our cookbook goes to the printers December, uh, excuse me, January 12th, and we're going to introduce it um, in time for Mother's Day so that everyone who cares about their mother or who is a mother uh, can get a Placer County cookbook and eat healthy food. Thanks. Thank Any you. other questions? I, I actually had another question. So when you say it will be available Mother's Day, will it be in bookstores? Where will we be able to find it? Um, you know what? We have sponsors in we, – we have some sponsors of this cookbook very nicely. Um, Isley's Nursery is going to be a sponsor. It will be available at the Farmer's Market, of course. Um, a place in Auburn called East West Yoga. The Roseville um, Sutter Medical Center is going to be a sponsor. Next to the decongestants? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, oh, yes, and we're having our launch on April 18th at the old uh, Blue Goose Packing Shed in Loomis. It, that seemed like an appropriate, and we're going to have a lot of food. Oh, it's I'll It's going to be, be there. all about <laughs> Placer County. So where should I put these? Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other public comments? Good morning. Good morning. I'm Ron Trebus with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association from uh, Tahoe City, California. And it's always great to be here on uh, Joanne Neff days um, <laughs> because I end up taking home a couple in the car, too. In fact, I think the last time Rocky um, the synephrine aided you. You were in a, a spot of real need of decongestant here, and it improved. It was living my, with commercial. my asthma, I'm always in need of it. So yeah, really plenty that's of what we heard. Um, I'm here today uh, for another topic, but uh, as long as we're here, Tom suggested that uh, that I bring to you, on behalf of the uh, board and the staff of the resort association, our fiscal year 0809 year-end report which is uh, contractually a, a part of our responsibilities for you, as well as the first quarter of 09-010, uh, 
uh, report. And so I wanted to just make sure that we brought a copy for each and every one of you and look forward to continuing the relationship and being able to help Placer County, the Board of Supervisors, as well as our community. And uh, here they are. Well, thank thank you. you very much. So this weekend we're going to get some snow up there, I understand. 12 to 18. Good. I hope that's feet, not inches. <laughs> Are there any other public comments? Seeing none, I will close public comments. Uh, how about supervisors committee reports? Jennifer? Um, I'm very pleased to be able to announce today that um, the TRPA will be rehearing the Kings Beach Commercial Corps Improvement Project at our January meeting. I believe it's scheduled for the first day of that meeting, which is January 27th. Um, and I'm hoping I haven't had the opportunity to ask Kirk yet, but since you'll be our chair at that point, I'm hoping that you'll be able to come up and, and represent Placer County as you always do so well um, and kind of put your oar in in support of the project as well. So, so that's on a Thursday, so that means I have a, to stay up and ski Friday, Saturday, that's Sunday? That's a Wednesday. <laughs> oh, Wednesday, sorry. okay. Then have I have to ski Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday. Friday. Yeah, it's, I know, it's, it's hard right, to I'm, I'm sure I can pull that off. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just so pleased that it's finally getting back in, in front of the governing board, and I have high hopes that um, we will get approval for that project, and Placer County will be able to move forward with the long-delayed redevelopment of downtown Kings Beach while ad addressing the issues about uh, traffic and safety within the grid. So, That's good to hear, because I have a vested interest in that moving forward. <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> I would just like to comment on Veterans Day. Uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, Auburn had, had a parade and everything. We don't have a parade in Roseville, but I assisted Ted Gaines. We had a breakfast uh, last Wednesday morning for the vets at the Vets Hall, and we served over 500 people. We had a lot of homeless people coming in, which was fine, but we ran out of pancakes. I forget how many, over 50 pounds, I think, of pancake mix they, they went through, but great turnout. And then we had a, a program in the auditorium, and then we had another program at 2 o'clock. So. But it was nice to remember our veterans, and uh, you know, it was just—it's it, very humbling to see and, and listen to some of the sacrifices our vets make on our behalf. And it's—it was—it was nice to be there and participate. Did you have a comment, Jim? Yeah, I uh, actually participated in the Auburn Veterans Day parade, uh, which recognized uh, the Vietnam vets. But the the parade had more people there this year than at the Fourth of July parade. And so it's really been a, a great um, enhancement to recognizing our veterans. And uh, the, uh, Cynthia Haynes uh, leads this uh, event, and we're anticipating more and more people to show up for that. So, but the, the parade was well received, and I don't know how many people there, but the streets were lined with, with people recognizing our veterans. So it was very great. Thank you. They came out to see you. Well, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kirk. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, as our board knows, um, August of last year, the board directed planning staff to initiate a, an update to the Granite Bay Community Plan. Um, at our last board meeting, I was remiss in not recognizing the uh, effort put in by our planning department. We held, um, I believe, our ninth community meeting, um, and this one in the form of a workshop to uh, visit and review the various uh, land use change requests and policy change requests that have been received uh, by staff um, in the first half of this year. And uh, the, the overwhelming response by the 200 plus residents that showed up at this workshop, the overwhelming response was that uh, it was very helpful, very informative, uh, and, and planning staff led by Michael Johnson, our CEDRA director, just did a, a bang up job making sure that we had uh, folks from planning, environmental health, public works, uh, any of the disciplines that, that uh, are going to be called into account as we go through the process of updating the community plan. Uh, they were just, um, uh, we had a, a number of folks come up to us that evening and have since received a number of email communications uh, thanking our staff for the fine work that they did in that, in that workshop. So just wanted to publicly acknowledge them and their efforts. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Move approval on consent. Second. Roll call. Euler. Vigant. Yes. Holmes. Yes. Montgomery. Yes. Rockcomb. Yes. 
Now we'll move into uh, our presentation on why we're here, and we'll turn it over to Ann Craig. Good morning, Mr. Chamber. Ch mm. Start over. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ann Craig, Personnel Services uh, Manager and members of the board. It is my great pleasure, as we do this each year, to bring forward to you uh, our employees who represent just collectively for the 20 years and 25 and 30 years of service, over 1,730 years of service to the county, its constituents. And on top of that, we also have out in the department another 178 employees who receive their, will be receiving their 10-year service awards and 64 more who will be receiving their 15-year awards for a grand total of 4,470 4, years of service to the county and everybody here uh, and the constituents. So it just is, just tickles me to uh, have this honor to do this each year. And with that, um, I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, this wouldn't happen without my compadre. Okay, she left. She moved back to the back. Ginger Barrett, who has worked so hard to put all this together for us. Uh, and there's also a reception following small cake uh, and coffee for all of our recipients. And Supervisor Rockholm, if you'd like to join us, or if you have words you'd like to say first, or well, I'll never pass up an opportunity to say something. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank everybody for the work that they do on, on for the constituents and for the citizens of this county. Uh, it's outstanding. We hear good, you know, things back from the, our constituents, and uh, I just appreciate, you know, the loyalty. I mean, obviously, the amount of years of service shows the loyalty to the county and, and uh, what they do, and I just want to thank you. Okay. Um, originally, I was going to ask all the 20-year people to shift, but I don't think that plan's going to work. So um, <laughs> we'll start with our 20-year service award recipients, and then we'll move from there to the 25, to the 30, and the 35, and all our department heads and elected officials after that. So try and gracefully move forward if you can without stepping on folks. Um, starting off for our 20-year, uh, is Kimber Goodman, who is with Admin Services. Yes. Jim Berry with the Agriculture and Commission and Sealer. Looks like Jim's not here. Okay. He's working. Diana Radin from the Auditor Controller's Office. Gail Wood from the Building Department. <laughs> Gina Langford from the Building Department. Oops, I'm sorry. Sorry, Gina. Your Community Redevelopment Agency. <laughs> Is Gina here? Okay. Uh, Gary Verissimo from the County Clerk Recorder. Gerald Lafay from the County Clerk Recorder. <laughs> Susan Taylor from the County Clerk Recorder. <laughs> Rich Caldwell from the County Exec's Office. Can we keep that going? Yeah. <laughs> Eric Comstock from the Par Department of Public Works. Okay. Hold on. We lost a box. Jess Alves from Public Works. A 
Our road guys must be out in the roads. <laughs> and Louis Garcia from Public Works. Marla Holvick from Public Works. Scott Blodger from Public Works. Kevin Mitchell from the uh, District Attorney's Office. Uh, Rhonda Hubbard from the District Attorney's Office. Steve Draglin from the District Attorney's Office. Okay. Uh, Jim Martin from, uh, you moved too fast? <laughs> Engineering and Survey. <laughs> no. And uh, Mike Henderson from uh, Engineering and Survey. Andy Fisher from uh, Facility Services. Chris Holmes from Facility Services. Dan Montgomery from Facility Services. Robert Unholtz from Facility Services. Uh, Bill Zimmerman from uh, Facility Services. And Deborah Kirschman from HHS, Health and Human Services. Sandra Vargas from HHS. Virginia Lindberry from Health and Human Services. We'll collect them all and get them all out, but thank you. Uh, William Foster from Health and Human Services. Bill? Yeah. And Bill Kirschman from Health and Human Services. Christy Lindquist from the library. And Janine Steinheimer, or a lot of you know her as Dupree from personnel. Uh, Brian Wiggum from the sheriff's office. Bruce Wilson from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, Donna Chris from the Sheriff's Office.
John Borden from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, Rick Padilla from the Sheriff's Office. Richard. Rich Tornberg from the Sheriff's Office. Shirley Cox from the Sheriff's Office. Stephen Murrell from the Sheriff's Office. <laughs> Terry Saget from the Sheriff's Office. <laughs> and last but not least on our 20-year group is Cindy Burroughs from the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office. <laughs> These are our 25-year employees. Linda Carlisle from Admin Services. <laughs> April Pay from Admin Services. Leslie Hobson from the County Exec's Office. <laughs> Kitty Thompson from Cedra. Uh, Bob Costa from Public Works. Loretta Anderson from Facility Services. Mary Dietrich from Facility Services. Albert Ritchie from Facility Services. Barbara Spivey from Facility Services. <laughs> Marvin Young from Facility Services. Cindy Brendage from HHS Health and Human Services. Brian Jones from HHS. <laughs> Celia Van Vliet from HHS, 25 years. <laughs> Lori Miller from Health and Human Services. <laughs> Suzanne McCabe from Health and Human Services. Send out individual invitations. <laughs> uh, Karen Barton from the library. Dan Pickens from Public Works. And Don Pruder from Public Works.
John Pratt from Public Works. And Phil Dyke from the Sheriff's Department. And Bill Langton from the Sheriff's Department. If that's easier for you, or we can do Okay, these are our 30-year employees, and we start off with Dave Mackenstadt from Community Development. <laughs> Carrie Cooey from Public Works. Charles Grant from Engineering and Surveying. Mike Cassidy from Facility Services. Bill Dudek from Facility Services. Deborah Lind from HHS. <laughs> and Richard Brown from HHS. And if Mike Fitch didn't get a picture of the 30-year recipients, all of them, please find Mike after the ceremony and make sure you get your picture taken. <laughs> okay, and starting with our elected officials and our uh, department heads who are receiving awards this year, uh, Ed Bonner, 35 years of uh, service. <laughs> Wes Zicker with 15 years of service. <laughs> you sure? No. <laughs> Tom Miller with 10 years of service. <laughs> I know. I'm just pulling the way the chairman pulls up the awards. <laughs> yeah. And Tony LaBeouf with 25 years of service. <laughs> and, that, and last but not least is uh, Christine Turner for the Ag Department. <laughs> you know. That's it. I have to. I have to tell you that um, Norm wasn't going to attend. I heard yesterday afternoon. Oh, okay. So um, yeah, we do have a 35-year employee this year. It was Norm Richardson, who's from Facility Services, but he wasn't going to be able to make it today. So. And I have to say that um, when I looked at this list, um, and having almost 25 years in here. I knew we were all children when we started because none of us have gotten to be this old. So congratulations to all of you. There is cake in the foyer out there for all of the recipients. 
I, I do. Uh, the bill is here. Yes, if the gym wants to say something. Oh, I just wanted to rep, uh, recognize a 15-year uh, employee that's been with us and very dedicated to Placer County, and that's Robert Wigan has been on the board for 15 years. <laughs> Thank all of you for coming today. You bet. You can take up the department here later on. It's amazing, 35 years.
for our next time item. We'll start with number five, uh, Mr. Bo uh, Bogan, for a blanket purchase order. In fact, we'll take, you can do 5A and B, right? Yes. I can do these quickly. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Jim Bogan, purchasing manager. Item 5A is requesting your board's approval for a six-month renewal of a competitively awarded blanket purchase order with Valley, Valley Toxicology Service for drug and alcohol laboratory services and phlebotomy services uh, needed for criminal prosecution by the district attorney's office. The original competitive contract was awarded in June 2006, and we believe it's time now to test the waters on this very complex service and see what's out there as far as competition. The six-month renewal will allow us time to con conduct that complex solicitation. Therefore, we request your approval to renew Valley Toxicology for six months and the maximum amount of $290,000. And we'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Kirk? Yeah, um, Mr. Owens from the District Attorney's Office is here. Uh, Scott, you guys have worked with these guys for quite some time. Um, I think we've worked at Valtox since I first served back in 92. And um, my understanding is this might be a good time for us to take a look at seeing what's available. Or we are continuing to look at what's available. As, as, as you know, we've been tasked with trying to reduce our budgets in this area. We have a long-standing relationship with uh, Valley Toxicology. They've been a fabulous vendor through the years. Um, uh, they're still a fabulous vendor. It's never been about the service. Uh, however, in, in an effort to reduce costs, we do, do feel obligated and uh, to, to, to look elsewhere at, and, and uh, to compare. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Scott. I'll, uh, I have a motion. Approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Item 5B is requesting your board's approval to renew a blanket purchase order based on a competitively bid State of California contract with Voyager Fleet Systems for credit card fuel purchases. Now, this is a backup contract to our contract for the car lot fuel services, the three places that we have uh, refueling locations in Auburn, uh, down in the Loomis area, and the Roseville-Lincoln area. So this is a backup for when people are um, traveling throughout the state or perhaps up at Tahoe or when those car lot facilities are not available. This contract, we ask for your approval in the maximum one-year amount of $650,000 uh, Fleet Services manages this program, manages the cards, uh, and it's a cost-effective way. We don't pay the federal tax on the fuel that we buy this way. And we'll be happy to answer any questions on That's this. That's a good thing. Well. Any questions? Do I have a motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, sir. County Clerk Recorder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. The item before you today is to approve our office to uh, negotiate and conclude a contract with the vendor Record Fusion. And this would be for a new clerk recorder system, which would include electronic recording and image redaction. Uh, image redaction is now required. And uh, this would be subject to county council and risk management's approval of the contract itself. It would approve a purchase of related equipment and um, all system and equipment costs. And all costs, including ongoing maintenance costs after the first year, would be paid from departmental trust funds that are uh, accrued for automation and, and micrographics, that's imaging, um, by uh, recording fees. So we have the, the money for this. Uh, we think this is uh, an excellent vendor. and. There are only a limited number of vendors that can provide electronic recording in the state of California. The, the uh, state certifies certain vendors. And of those vendors that can provide a complete system um, of both not just electronic recording but a full clerk recording system, there are only a couple. And as I note in the memo, none of them happen to be uh, California-based companies at this time. And um, therefore, we think we've picked the best vendor that we can find, and it's one that is 
uh, flexible. There's not just one way of doing business their way. Uh, so they can support our current operations and uh, identify any other cha any changes that we might consider. In addition, uh, as part of this uh, package, the electronic recording uh, could allow other smaller counties that would never be able to afford a full electronic recording system themselves to use our county portal uh, as a transfer mechanism for uh, the limited amount of electronic recording that they might want to do also. And um, so it provides a benefit uh, potentially for other counties in addition to ourselves. But first and foremost, we think it's uh, an excellent system, excellent vendor. Um, the ongoing price after it's implemented would be less than we're paying today for a system that cannot do um, electronic recording and nor automated redaction at this point. Um, and lastly, I not included in this proposal, but I expect to bring a follow-on contract uh, proposal which would uh, allow us to, at the concurrently with this, to consider converting our 1972 to 1999 uh, images that are currently on roll film to digital files that can also uh, uh, come up and not have to make copies off of film and integrate those with our uh, computer index at the same time it's being converted. So in the long run, it would be a more cost-effective approach to do that conversion and integration at the same time. But today's proposal is for the system, um, implementation, uh, the licensing, and again, the ongoing price would be less than we pay today, and all to be paid from uh, non-general fund trust funds. Kirk. Oh, I'm sorry. That was on more. Is there any other questions? Uh, Jennifer. I have a question. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make sure I understood uh, part of the proposal um, on page 16. It's page 2 of your presentation. Okay. Thank um, you. It says, Record Fusion also offers Placer the opportunity to provide smaller counties in California the benefits of electronic recording. I'm assuming that we're talking about Nevada County, other counties that would then use this system, our system? Uh, not Nevada County. What, it, uh, what they would use is uh, portal access that would allow the transfer of documents electronically from submitters to the county, to their counties. And we're thinking probably more likely the very smallest counties where there might, for example, title companies might not in some cases even have offices in some of those very small counties. And so this would not only save title company time, but it would, uh, they might never, the county itself might never have the volume of transactions that they could ever collect enough money from the surcharge that's allowed for electronic recording, but they could never otherwise participate. And the vendor has structured a three-tiered proposal that would allow even the smallest of counties potentially to have documents transferred to them and electronically. Would, would we charge those small counties some it, nominal fee for that? That is uh, likely, yes. Okay, thank you. So it truly would be without cost and potentially uh, a small, at least a small stream of revenue. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a motion. Move approval. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> We have time for number seven. Yes, Jennifer. Good morning. Um, Joanne Auerbach, Housing Program Coordinator. And the action before your board today is to uh, authorize the Chief Assistant CEO to sign a subrecipient agreement with the cities of Lincoln and Rockland and authorize an increase in the housing loan lane limit for the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Uh, Placer County has been already approved for an allocation of approximately $2 million in federal NSP funds to deal with bank-owned properties. Uh, the NSP program allows these funds to be used in North Auburn, Bowman, Sheridan, Forest Hill, Kings Beach, Tahoe Vista, and parts of the cities of Rockland and Lincoln. Now, your board um, authorized the application for NSP funds and a cooperative agreement with Lincoln and Rockland in June of this year. And this subrecipient agreement is just a further step to implement uh, that application and agreement. 
Agency staff has been working closely with the cities over the past year to meet the requirements of this program, and we have all the authorization and conditions in place. Uh, we anticipate that we'll be ready to commit loan funds by the end of December. The funds can be used to loan money to low and moderate income households to buy properties directly from a bank. Um, but for those bank-owned properties that are in need of rehabilitation, Placer County, Rockland and Lincoln will enter into a contract and loan agreement with Mercy Housing, a nonprofit, to acquire the bank-owned properties, repair them, and then they will resell them to low and moderate income home buyers and we will be paid back from those first deeds of trust. Mercy Housing was selected in August as part of a jointly issued RFP. The attached resolution authorizes that signature on the subrecipient agreement and also raises the loan limits for a combined acquisition and rehabilitation loan uh, in just the NSP program to 300,000. Um, the State Department of Housing and Community Development administers these federal funds and requires this subrecipient agreement in order for the money to go from the county to Rockland and Lincoln. The subrecipient agreement contains a lot of repetition of the same federal language that's in the cooperative agreement that's already been signed by the cities and in the state standard agreement uh, with the budgets and the scope of work that are also attachments to the agreement that's before you today. Placer County will be responsible, as required by the state, for administering this program and tracking the funds. Uh, this will be done by redevelopment agency staff with reimbursement f with NSP funds, and also NSP funds will reimburse um, any work that we do on behalf of Rockland and Lincoln. So that's my comments today, but uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Have any questions? Seeing none, I'll take a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank Good you very job. much. Do we have time to do one more before we talk uh, about Yes, we can go to proceed. I don't see Ms. Merchant in the she audience here, but yes. I'll go to step down. Just stepped out. Uh, we do have a presentation. I'll go ahead and lead it in on item 8A. This is uh, by the North Tahoe uh, Resort Association, and there's a request here for your board to approve a million dollar budget to the item. <laughs> we move fast around here. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was checking on my PowerPoint, which I didn't see as I was sitting out in the audience. Um, so we may have to move forward without that too. It, it happens magically. It falls out of the sky. No need yeah, to worry. Oh no, that's okay. We don't. I don't need it. I just wanted to make sure it was up and I didn't see it. So good morning. Good morning. Chairman Rockall, members of the board, Jennifer Merchant, thank you, Tom, and I apologize for, for missing the beginning of the, the uh, presentation. As Tom mentioned, uh, the uh, recommended expenditure of $1,075,503 in TOT funds will support construction of the final three phases of the Tahoe City Public Utility District's Lakeside Multipurpose Trail in Tahoe City. And uh, the project, which I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with because Placer County has participated in other phases of this, um, would be connecting missing links of the trail between Heritage Plaza and the state campground and parallels Lake Tahoe and includes sections of paved trail and raised boardwalk, ADA access, benches, seat walls, bike racks, interpretive signage, lighting, stormwater drainage, and scenic overlook. So as you can see, it's much more than just a, a few feet of, of pavement. Um, the project encompasses three short but very distinct and complex trail segments that cross private, public, and state properties. The total uh, phase five, six, and seven project cost is estimated right now at $4.3 million and most of the remaining funds needed for this project are expected to be provided by the California Tahoe Conservancy, who is a major project funding partner. If approved, this roughly $1.1 million allocation would represent nearly $2 million in committed funds to the entire Lakeside Trail project from Placer County. So we are a significant partner in the project as well. Um, this, uh, 
leverages more than $10 million in other agency partner funding. That includes land acquisition, trail, and related improvements. And uh, Lakeside Bike Trail is also part of a larger looped trail system that is being developed to connect Tahoe City, Squaw Valley, Truckee, North Star, and Kings Beach along the North Shore and Highways 89 and 267. Uh, the project is consistent with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association's Tourism and Con Community Investment Master Plan, and your board's approval was unanimously recommended by the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association Board of Directors. Um, and it is listed as a priority project in that plan, um, as uh, bike trails normally are because of the recreation service that it provides as well as uh, access, um, transportation access um, with non-automobile purposes. The project funding has been set aside and is currently available in the county treasury and was allocated from TOT funds explicitly maintained for the purpose of infrastructure development in the Tahoe area. And due to the project's complexity and the fact that the recommended allocation represents a significant expenditure of TOT funds, we have invited Cindy Gustafson here today. She's a general manager of the Tahoe City Public Utility District to provide additional detail about the project, and that's the, the PowerPoint that she will be um, pre presenting to you shortly. Also, Ron Trevis is here, as you know. You saw him this morning. He would be available also to answer any questions. So, Cindy, can you come up? Sure. Thanks. I have it on there. There we go. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Jennifer has done such a great job uh, covering this. I don't know how much more I need to take of your time, but I will walk you through a few slides that will hopefully uh, explain a little bit more about this trail. For your information, the PUD has been involved in bicycle trails since the early 70s. And even though I wasn't quite around that long ago, um, I've been working on this particular segment for 19 years of my career. So uh, I uh, feel like it's uh, part of my legacy that I hope someday that we'll get it completed and then maybe I can think about a service award or retirement. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I've got an arrow. Did I go the right way? There we it go. Is. Um, so I mentioned that we've been in the uh, trail business since the um, early 1970s and constructed about 19 miles of trail to date. Uh, those sections you see outlined in red with a few key missing links. And uh, one of the important parts, there we go. Uh, one of the important parts uh, for the district has been trying to connect those missing links because what we find is when people are riding along families, especially using our trail system, when they get to a missing link, they tend to not want to put their families or their children out onto the highway uh, to get around that. So we really see that the missing links, uh, filling those gaps is critical to uh, continue to support. And there's just phenomenal Phenomenal support uh, for our trails, as Jennifer mentioned, both from our residents and our visitors in the system. Right okay, the right arrow. Thank you. Thank Whoops. You. I'm not that sure about the, the Williams. Right arrow. That was the wrong right arrow. <laughs> Let's. There we go. And so there's an aerial view of the segments of Lakeside Trail. Obviously, it's a very complex missing link. And the reason these links are missing is we ran into obstacles as we were developing the trail network. Because it goes right through the urban core of downtown Tahoe City, we've had to work very, very closely with a lot of different property owners, uh, especially those, uh, obviously, the private properties along the lakefront who depend on that nexus to their waterfront as part of their business opportunities. Um, and if I could just take a step back, why is this part of community planning in Tahoe? We can't build new roads. When we have transportation issues in Tahoe, we're really looking at how we get people out of their cars, walking through the Tahoe City Sidewalk Project or through the bike trails. So both your, uh, the TRPA community plan as well as the general plan for Tahoe City uh, and the regional transportation plan all call for linking these bicycle trails and completing this important network. Uh, I mentioned earlier both visitors and residents rank traffic as the most significant issue they face in, in enjoying Lake Tahoe, and they rank trail connections as really critical and very highly supported. Usually we're getting 80 
to 90 percent support, strong support for our bicycle trail network. The district commits about a quarter of a million dollars a year to maintaining that. And in your budget, that's maybe not so much, but in our budget, that's a significant amount of what we dedicate to Parks and Rec. It's about a quarter of our uh, budget for our par all of our park facilities that we maintain. Um, these are some of the segments we've constructed. You can see it's much more than a bicycle trail. On the left is Fanny Bridge, infamous Fanny Bridge. And uh, many of you were at our ribbon cutting and celebration of getting this uh, alternative bridge built on the backside of the dam. Uh, took us a number of years of supplemental EIR and a lot of regulatory approvals to get that section complete. As I mentioned, I've been only working on this 19 years. It actually, the original project study started back in 1976. How are we going to get these trails connected through the, the core of Tahoe City? And uh, there's a timeline. We, we certainly hope with uh, your support of this funding as well as the California Tahoe Conservancy support that we'll be able to complete this trail in 2011. Again, uh, the aerial of the map through the urbanized areas. The phases that we'll be constructing uh, begin with phase five, which starts at the bottom of Grove Street, if you're familiar with Grove Street in Tahoe City, and then heads uh, over to the west side up through the State Park Recreation Area. Phase five uh, through the Roundhouse and Boatworks Mall area. And you can see what we're dealing with with um, existing uses and how we wind a bike trail through there and coordinate with the property owners. Property owners have been strongly supportive but obviously very concerned with how we get through this area, not only ultimately with the trail, but how we're going to build it not to affect their business operations. So uh, a lot of staging and a lot of uh, pre-thought into when we'll build and how we'll build uh, these segments through the, uh, through the uh, commercial areas. And uh, so there's the more detailed map of the design. It will include bollards to separate the trail users from the business properties. Um, and also, especially at the marina, let's see if I can get the laser right, right here where the marina accesses and brings boats in and out, we were gonna, we'll have to have a, a fixed um, chains that actually stop bicycle trail use during that movement of hauling boats in and out. Um, and that has to be part of their operations. They've agreed to it and, and support this uh, uh, alternative and how we've designed that. We've worked very closely with them. Phase six uh, then goes through the, boat uh, the Lighthouse Shopping Center, uh, below the Lighthouse Shopping Center area, which is where our Safeway store is, for those of you who visited uh, that area. And it goes through uh, some pretty significant wetlands. And so there's some raised boardwalks through this area. Uh, it is just above our sewer line, but nonetheless, uh, by the regulatory agency's um, uh, approval process, we are going to have to build raised boardwalks through that area. And then phase seven winds up. Uh, as you can see, we have to gain quite a bit of elevation. That's why the loop uh, to get up back up to the state uh, highway there at the end uh, through the state park property. We'll be doing quite a bit of restoration in the state park property. Uh, I've worked personally with five different state park superintendents over the years, each one with a little differing viewpoint on what we needed to do on their property to try to help uh, mitigate some of the concerns they have. There is quite a bit of erosion and revegetation and voluntary trail use that we will be trying to consolidate onto the one trail as we go through that area. And that's kind of what the alignment will look like coming up through there. And there's quite a bit of restoration and BMPs and all the things that go along with uh, construction of the trail. A little bit about our trails as well. I know often I get asked in the resort association, obviously this is very important, and the regulatory agencies. Well, gee, these are just trails for recreation. Well, they're really not. Most of the traffic that we have in Tahoe is recreation traffic. People going to and from locations to recreate, but people going out to lunch for their recreation, people going shopping for their recreation, and people who actually just ride for recreation. Um, when we survey folks, we find 60% are actually taking the trail as a means to walk into town to get their newspaper or to walk or to ride their bikes to a, uh, another recreation location or to go out to lunch at the Bridge Tender Restaurant, as many of you have done. Um, and so we find that 60% are actually using them for transportation elements. And then who are the users? Residents and property owners make up about a third. 
and visitors make up about 66 percent of the use of the trail. And more and more we're seeing, uh, and I've got other slides, but for purposes of brevity, we didn't bring, we didn't want to bore you to death with all the survey data, um, but more and more we're seeing a lot of the Truckee area coming over to use these trails and the significance of connecting all these trails I think you'll see uh, really in, in creating uh, another world-class attraction other than the lake is uh, this idea of these trail networks. Um, a lot of different funding sources, Jennifer had kind of mentioned this, and uh, we, a lot of my job prior to becoming general manager was trying to line these up. Um, I've enjoyed being able to get out of a little bit of that detail and, um, and looking at the numbers uh, and the various funding sources that we've used to date uh, to secure funds for this trail. The district's role has typically been on these bike trails. We will agree to maintain them and deal with all the maintenance and operations, but we do look for outside funding to be the majority uh, of the funding for these purposes. As I mentioned, our budget's about 8.2 million. You can imagine a $4 million project is, is a pretty significant contribution um, for our board of directors. It, it would be um, impossible for us to do it on our own. We absolutely depend on uh, outside funding, and that's why we were so supportive of the whole TOT increase in getting money for infrastructure for the Tahoe Basin. Um, our budget uh, spent to date on this particular project is $8.6 million. Our estimates for final uh, these three phases is $4.3 million. And uh, as we mentioned, the, the request through the Resort Association is the $1,775,000. The remaining uh, funds, earlier on your consent calendar, you approved some, uh, an application for a bicycle trail uh, lane account. We are trying to secure as many other funding sources as possible. Um, and if granted, uh, the Resort Association funding would be about 25% of the project. So uh, we feel very comfortable that the state is going to hopefully recover enough that they can sell some more bonds and the Conservancy can help fund it. It is uh, in a meeting Tom and Jennifer and I attended with Patrick Wright from the California Tile Conservancy. He's very optimistic and very supportive of completing this trail uh, with funds next spring when the Conservancy hopefully will have those that they can commit. Um, about 2,400 linear feet of trail itself, but uh, here are some of the components that have led to the high price uh, in, in additional areas for the, uh, the project that really expand it from a trail to more of a parkway. And as you've seen, the segments that uh, we've completed to date, they become much more elaborate with seat walls, fractured granite walls along them and a lot of the community uh, plan guidelines for urban development. We've had quite a bit of public input on these design of these trails. And as I've often said, the easy trails got built before I came to the district. The, the hard ones are what are left and are very complicated and thus uh, very costly and time consuming to, to complete. Um, hopefully I haven't bored you too much and if you have any questions, be happy to answer those. Thank you. Uh, Robert? Cindy, your conversations with Patrick, um, in the event that the uh, bonds do not uh, get approved, uh, I'm assuming that that's going to delay the delivery of the full project. Mm -hmm. so any comments on that or perspective regarding that? We, we are really hoping to bid the whole, the, the, the climate right now for bids is so incredible as I know you're aware, and we would really like to bid the entire project. Um, over this, uh, we'd hope to go out maybe in March, February or March for bidding for next summer to start. We know it'll be a two-year construction. Um, if the conservancy funds aren't there, then we would phase phase it. We would hope that maybe we're going to be fortunate. Um, it, it sounds pretty optimistic that Patrick is going to devote a significant amount of money to this project. Um, but we can phase the project. Unfortunately, I think when we phase it, uh, you have fewer uh, contractors interested in bidding the project. There's less economies of scale for the contractor, a lot of mobilization, demobilization costs, especially in this area. So we, you know what, we're <laughs> very optimistic that we're going to try to be able to build this entire project. We also are hopeful the bids will come in less um, than what we've estimated. We, we 
always try to be on that side of things if we can. Uh, in the past, what we've done is always repay the local funds first. If the bids come in more than what we need, then the resort association funds, I think on three previous projects, we've actually paid back uh, funds to the resort association, turned back over funds that weren't necessary because the bids came in lower than anticipated. So that's what we're hoping for. Um, the bicycle trail account uh, with the state and the county's application for that should certainly help if the conservancy funds don't come through. So the worst case would be phasing. Phasing would be the worst case. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Um, one of the things that I just wanted to touch on briefly because we had a presentation on this, I think, two meetings ago, is the fact that by creating complete connectivity through these trails, we are actually allowing people to get off the roads and stop driving lower vehicle miles traveled. And, and the issue that's specific to that is the TMDL question. I, I think there is actually a, a benefit to us at the county level in terms of meeting those TMDL goals that Lahontan is putting forward. They were talking about a system of credits that we're essentially going to have to meet. This is potentially an opportunity to start accruing those credits because there is a clear relationship between continuous bike paths and getting people out of their cars. So um, you, you touched on it sort of tangentially, but I really just wanted to bring that point up more specifically. Thank you. Thank, and thanks for adding that. It's very important. I... Uh, yes, just two points. One, first of all, to appreciate you and your board for the leadership in providing a bike trail, Cindy. Is it uh, without the TCPUD taking the lead on these projects? We know how cumbersome and how difficult <laughs> it is to do these things. And having a local agency that uh, really takes these responsibilities on, does the hard work out there, excellent partner with the county in terms of maintaining the beaches for the county, the county owned beaches in many ways. The second part is just to make it very clear that these are infrastructure funds that have been collected through transit occupancy taxes, which are the TOT taxes as we know, but the public may not, that are collected up in the Tahoe Basin, that a percentage of those over many years have been dedicated only to infrastructure because that was part of the, uh, call it the social contract by which the public up there voted for the increase in the TOT tax, that they would go to projects like this. So these are not monies that can be spent on other things. The Resort Association for their role in, in managing those funds, working with uh, TCPUD and others to make sure that promise was adhered to and these kind of projects materialize. But I think that needs to be acknowledged and especially the hard work of the Public Utility District and really making these things happen. We could not do it in their absence up there. So thank you again. Well, thank, thank you, Tom. Thanks thank for you. the kind words. Yeah, have a motion. Move approval. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Good job. Great. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll have a there. big party when this thing gets done. Our first meeting, <laughs> our first meeting of 2010 will ride the bike trail. Okay. Thank you. Now we will move to our 10 o'clock timed item, which is a presentation of the Commemorative Coin Awards. And uh, we all have someone to award, so I think that I will start to my left with Jennifer, Jim, and then Robert and Kirk, and then I'll, I'll go last. That's okay. Um, thank you, Rocky, for letting me go first. I think I'm, I'm a little unfamiliar with this process, so if I, if I don't do it exactly as I should, my apologies. Um, we're, we're here today, as you know, to award the commemorative coins to, um, let me get this terminology correctly. We are, um, each supervisor is given the opportunity to award a coin recipient that meets one of the following criteria. Uh, these, this individual or individuals offered contribution of longstanding service to Placer County or to a resident thereof, sacrificed a combination of time and talent to a Placer County or resident thereof, went beyond the call of duty to save a life, voluntarily performed an, the act of heroism and was not paid for the act, participated in a rarely told or repeated reported feat, dramatically improved or impacted a life. So a, a, a number of of criteria. Um, my recipients today, and I want to first take the opportunity to, to thank Supervisor Holmes, who um, offered one of his coins to me to present because I had three folks I really wanted to present to. Uh, these coins today are going to be going to Sergeant Bill Walton, and if you could come forward as I say your name, that would be great. Deputy Michael Bennett, 
who I believe is on vacation and can't be here today, uh, and Deputy Paul Long. Who is also on vacation. Also on vacation and can't be here today. Um, Sergeant Walton, Deputy Bennett, and Deputy Long, hopefully we're all here today, to receive this award for helping talk a suicidal woman off the Forest Hill Bridge in a three-hour standoff. The officers used their extensive training, skills, and most important, empathy to do this. <coughs> I came across a comment, um, an anonymous comment on the Auburn Journal website when I was uh, reviewing the details of the event. Um, and I believe this anonymous commenter actually best summed up why we're recognizing Sergeant Walton and the two deputies today. The commenter said, the deputies of Flasser County do their jobs out of integrity and compassion for the community. Their initial call to duty is spurred by a heartfelt commitment to do the right thing. If you've ever read the job description of deputy sheriff, you'll know it describes the position with specific job duties and then any other related duties, a catch-all phrase. Standing atop the Forest Hill Bridge, 730 feet above the river bread, and talking down a suicidal subject is a growing call classification for sheriff's deputies. Only those who have stood there know how that feels. They are willing to put their own safety aside for the welfare of a stranger. And I just really, I, whoever that anonymous commenter was couldn't have put it better. Sergeant Walton and deputies Bennett and Long are examples to all of us. They are daily doing a job that is tough, unforgiving, often thankless and normally unrecognized. Today, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to publicly recognize their actions. Congratulations to you, Sergeant Walton, and my most sincere thanks. I'm really honored to be able to work with you here at the county and hoping that you can pass these along to the deputies. Thank you, Jennifer. Hope I did that right. You did fine. <laughs> the important thing is is honoring the folks that we honor, and that's that's what it's all about. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as many of you remember, on uh, Sunday, August 30th, we had the uh, terrible fire in North Auburn. 275 acres were burned. 66 homes were destroyed. Several businesses. But thankfully, no lives were lost. And the Placer County Sheriff's Department personnel were on scene minutes after the alarm went off and began alerting residents to evacuate. Placer County Deputy Sheriff Ken Scogan was one of those officers. And Ken, if you want to please come down. I'll put you and, in the, uh, the humble uh, Ken Scogan. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Scogan was at uh, South Park Place uh, when a resident rushed to him and said that his mother was trapped inside her burning home and couldn't get out. 89 year old. Eleanor Brown was standing in the burning house holding on to her walker, unable to come to the window when Deputy uh, Scogan um, called to her. Seeing that he was going to have to go in to rescue her, he kicked the door in. Uh, she wouldn't let go of the walker. He had to actually pry her hands off the walker, lifted her, carried her out of the building. Chaos all around. There was no way to get an ambulance in there, so they transported her to the hospital with a, a sheriff's sheriff's car. It was reported that the deputy, Deputy Scogan collapsed for a minute from the inhaling all the uh, smoke that uh, he had to inhale. Uh, but after he rested for a minute, he was back on the scene, continuing checking houses amid the flying embers. He worked until midnight that night and was back on the job the next morning at six o'clock. Deputy Scogan is a graduate of East Valley High School in Spokane Valley, Washington. He's been working for the Placer County Sheriff's Department since January 2007. 
He is currently assigned to the day shift in the North, North Auburn Bowman Area Working Patrol. Because of his heroic actions, Deputy Scogan has been recognized by many local and national uh, newspapers, TV media. Recently, the American Red Cross recognized him as one of the 2009 hometown heroes. The day after the fire, Governor Schwarzenegger was uh, in Auburn with uh, Sheriff Bonner, myself, uh, Supervisor Montgomery, met with Deputy Scogan at the fire site, pointed out that there is a benefit to pumping up. <laughs> <laughs> and looking at Deputy Scogan, you can understand why his fellow officers have given him the nicknames of Thor and the Viking. <laughs> <laughs> True to form, any hero who was just doing their job, Deputy Scogan was no exception, saying that I did what I had to do. I did what anybody else in green or tan or blue uniform would do. Anyone who wears the badger patch would do this. It's my great honor to present you with the commemorative coin. Jim, rightfully so. Jim's very privilege for me today to uh, provide these coins to two members of my community, Lincoln, uh, both of whom I've known pretty much all my life. So the first, Shirley, if you'd come up to the podium, please. Uh, I would describe both of these people as being incredibly passionate about their community, uh, each of which have special uh, specialties, if you will, within that passion. And in Shirley's case, uh, it's education and specifically libraries. Uh, but Shirley uh, began her career as an educator in Lincoln High School after growing up in the Lincoln area and attending local schools. Another example of brilliance uh, from Lincoln High School zebra. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shirley taught uh, for several years in the classroom and then moved into the position as lead teacher in the new primetime education program in 1995. This program was for extra assistance to students in reading and math with addition uh, for art on Fridays. At one point, the school district could not fund the position, so the local PTA funded the position to keep Shirley in that position. Um, she also began Poetry Place for fifth graders through high school, able to continue for several years. Uh, she, in addition to that, began uh, the program Books in the Courtyard to obtain grant funding to buy new books and then give them away to children in the community. Once a week during the summer, all children in the community are invited to come to the courtyard behind the Carnegie Library to pick out a free book. The program is currently uh, for six weeks for children up to the fifth grade. Uh, she's always had an active interest, as I mentioned, in the library system. Uh, Lincoln is fortunate to have a Carnegie Library, uh, but also a brand new one. Uh, Shirley uh, helped uh, in a grant to the Bill Gates Foundation that somewhere in the process got messed up and the information wasn't correct. She sat down, worked through it. It was to provide technology to the new uh, library and actually got the grant application fixed and was successful in getting uh, the program funded. Um, she has met with the Lincoln Women's Club to start a project for gathering stories, old-time Lincolnites to preserve history in the community. Uh, the project eventually evolved into Better Together Project with partnerships with the Native Sons of California, Native Daughters, Lincoln Archives, as well as the Women's Club. 
Uh, she managed to obtain a large grant from the state of California this project and then a large private donation to fund it. Uh, she became director of the Lincoln Archives, assuming the position that Lincoln's historian, Jerry Logan, originated. The archives is now located in the old Civic Auditorium building with ample space for office, meeting room, and displays. She is currently a member of the Native Sons of the Golden West in Lincoln, as well as president of the Native Daughters, and in recent years she was honored with memberships in Lincoln High School Hall of Fame. Um, and in both of these cases, these are just the kind of community people who actually dedicate their lives to making their particular community better, and they're always there, they're always doing certain things, and they're the kind of people that when they call us, we always respond to their request because we're afraid not to, but surely <laughs> it's a real pleasure. So Robert, Shirley could probably tell us really what kind of student you really were. <laughs> I would just like to say, uh, chairman and board members, one person can't do it alone. It's better to gather, and I feel like the Pied Piper, and every time I look back, there's this cadre of people behind me. So I thank all those people in Lincoln that have actually won this award. <laughs> well, thank you for being the leader, and I'd like to recognize that uh, Council Member Joyner is here and Cosgrove. Uh, to witness this, so thank you both for coming. My next award goes to Rich Wyatt. Rich, if you'd come up, please. Uh, Richard and I essentially grew up together. Uh, he graduated a year ahead of me from Lincoln High School. Uh, Richard uh, was student body president uh, my junior year and was the one who actually designed the fighting zebra, who I just have to mention again, defeated the Plaster High School. <laughs> Went 10-0 this year in football, and, and I'm sure it was because of Richard's grand design that that, uh, that, that all had more momentum. Uh, I'd also want to mention that Richard's, one of his younger brothers and uh, sister also were student body presidents in Lincoln High School. And in full disclosure, I have to state that I ran for student body president my senior year and lost. So I want, want everyone to know that. You should have quit um, while you were ahead. Uh, well, <laughs> you know me, Kirk, I never do. Uh, Richard, again, like Shirley, just one of those guys that's always in the community, dedicating his time uh, for free. His passion is historic architecture. His fingerprints and interests are all over the restoration of the courthouse here in, in Auburn. Um, and actually gave me a tour of the courthouse when it was under construction, thinking that I would find that part of the architecture and engineering as interesting as the finished product, but you have to understand Richard's passion for seeing the insides of all of that and how it works. Um, Richard, um, I can't begin to explain to you uh, the kinds of things that he's just constantly, constantly doing in the community, and I don't want to mention all of these things because it wouldn't mean that much to those of you who don't live in Lincoln, but I have a list of at least 12 projects that Richard has completely dedicated his architectural work for in Lincoln uh, for free. Uh, the most recent one being the, the Lincoln Lighthouse, uh, the current work that the county is partnering on for social services. Um, and he's just always doing those kinds of things, but I would like to highlight uh, that he uh, was a key volunteer, drew the plans, did a tremendous amount of behind the scenes work for the Carnegie Library in Lincoln, uh, applied similar interest to the Scout Hall, another historic building in Lincoln, didn't have quite as much success on that one. Uh, he is... Tore it down. Yeah, anyway, I guess not. Uh, <laughs> member of Lincoln Rotary since 1986. Uh, he was a member of the Lincoln Planning Commission from 79 until 1992 and then served again from 2000 until 2008. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to give Rich his word and give it to you. Richard also, if you want to say anything, you'd be welcome to do that.
I want to thank the board and uh, other uh, members of the supervisors for the, the award. Uh, my passion certainly is historic preservation, whether it be new or old, and uh, working in Lincoln uh, uh, has been a, a lot of fun. And uh, thank you very much. Next, uh, it'll be Supervisor Euler. I'd like to ask uh, Jim Lane and, and his wife uh, Donna if they would come up as, long as, as well as their son. If Jason is with you this morning, Jason, if you guys would come on up. While they're coming up, uh, Jim and his family, residents of the Granite Bay area. Uh, Jim's my selection for the commemorative coin this year. Please go ahead. For several reasons, primarily among these is that uh, he has taken on the role of leader of the ongoing Eureka Union School District's canned food drive and Christmas basket program. When Jim got involved with this program about 13 years ago, I believe, um, it was being run primarily out of Green Hills Elementary School uh, by Clara Taylor to meet the needs of uh, families in our area. I believe about 20 to 30 families were having their needs met by this program at that time. Over the years, uh, uh, with Jim's leadership, the program has expanded to include Granite Bay High School, Adelante High School, uh, other families in the Eureka School District. The program now serves over 100 families, close to 300 children. Uh, Jim has, uh, has gotten his club, the Granite Bay Rotary Club, involved, the Granite Bay Kiwanis Club, Eureka, the Eureka Union School District. They all help share in the cost of this program. Uh, canned food is collected in conjunction with KCRA's Kids Can in October. Jim and his team distribute all the KCRA collection boxes, the pliers, the promotional materials. Uh, they get these out to schools. They collect and store the food at Olive Ranch School for distribution in December. Their efforts typically generate about 400 to 500 boxes of canned food for needy families in the South Placer area. Uh, the gifts then are collected at several schools through donation boxes and through participation in the Angel Tree program. For example, Cavett Junior High through their Angel Tree was able to provide all the teenage kids gifts throughout the district. Uh, the Parent Teachers Club at several schools are now providing each student with a school shirt or sweater as an additional Christmas present. This year the canned food drive is being held this month with nine schools participating in the Granite Bay area. Uh, in December, a toy drive and angel tree will be held throughout the Eureka Union School District area. And on December 11th, volunteers are going to gather to sort out the canned food and the Christmas gifts. <coughs> Pardon me. The baskets will be completed and delivered on December 12th. In addition to his service as chairman of the annual Eureka Union School District canned food drive and Christmas basket program, Jim is and has been very active in Granite Bay and Rotary as past president. Uh, the 2008 recipient of Rotary's Community Service Award, an active member of Bayside Church, uh, where I see his vehicle growing through the parking lot with his uh, Jim Lane Realtor sign on it, looking for a parking space on any given Sunday. Um, he's been active in Bayside, serving in the men's ministry uh, as a leader there, and also heading up uh, the one of the construction teams in Bayside's annual outreach down to Mexico, where Bayside sends hundreds of uh, six, seven hundred high school students down to Mexicali to help uh, build structures, schools, homes for people down in Mexicali. Jim heads one of the construction teams in that program. Um, you, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to imagine the man with that commitment to volunteerism actually has a full-time job, uh, but for the last 22 years Jim's been involved in real estate with Roseville's Lion Real Estate Office. Uh, he's been happily married to Donna for 27 years. They have two sons. Jason is with us today. Uh, Jason is 19. Adam is 18. Uh, both, I'm proud to say, are Eagle Scouts from um, Second to None Troop 121 in Granite Bay. And um, the reason that it was important to me to have your wife and son here with you is, number one, uh, you serve as an example to your family what community participation means, and you lead by example. And number two, um, those of us that serve on this board know the time that volunteering takes um, away from your family. And so it's only by the love and support that you show to your father that he's able to do so much of what he, your father and husband, uh, that he's able to do so much of what he does in the community. So this is in recognition of Jim, uh, but it's reflective of the commitment that your family has to our community, and I thank you for it.
around there. All right, you stand over here. We'll keep the beauty together on one side. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Kurt. Now it's my turn. Diane, would you please come to the podium? I get to honor <clears throat> two very special people this morning, and my first one is Diane Howe, who is one of the hardest working individuals I've ever met in my life. She uh, is just a huge asset uh, to her community and to the residents of Placer County. Diane has been a resident of the Dry Creek Placer County community since 1977. She has vast contributions to the Dry Creek community area and to District 1. She is a wife of Steve Howe, mother of two daughters, and grandmother of four grandchildren, not to mention that she also operates a daycare facility at her home. Diane works tirelessly for the community. She has served on the following boards and committees. Parent club officer, room mother, school site council member 1977 to 1985, Dry Creek Fire District Secretary 1984 to 1999, Dry Creek Joint Elementary School Board of Trustees 1985 to present and eight years as president, nine years as a clerk and seven years member. Sacramento Medical Foundation Board of Directors Blood Source 1990 to 1995, Dry Creek Fire Advisory Committee Vice Chair, Secretary and Treasurer 2001 to the present, Lasher County Board Trustee of the Year 2006, member of various task forces in the school district such as transportation, facilities, CSR, SALT, and strategic planning. She's worked on various school bond elections for Roseville High School and Dry Creek Schools. And she's <coughs> also one of my uh, stalwart members of the Ma my Mac, the only one I've got, thank goodness I only got one. Uh, <laughs> 2000 to, to the present, Diane has provided much guidance to us during the transition from Bill Santucci to myself and has just been a huge asset. She has a great historical knowledge of the Dry Creek community in District 1. And again, she just serves tirelessly. I don't know where she finds the energy, but she is such an asset to that community and to, to me and to the residents uh, that live in the Dry Creek community. So it's my great honor to uh, give her this commemorative coin. Thank you very much for, um, I I'm so humbled by this because to me what I do is just what people should do in their community. And thank you for reappointing me to the fire board, I think. <laughs> you reappointed me last time for until 2013, so. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> Now my next honoree is, is a person that I always makes me feel like a better person when I'm with him, especially around military, and we were together uh, last Wednesday morning, but Colonel Lathrop, would you please come forward? He has his wife with him. Mary, would you like to join him? I'd like her to join me. Okay. <laughs> oh, I don't need that. <laughs> Colonel Lathrop has been assigned to the position of commanding officer for the 115th Regional Support Group headquartered in Roseville, California on June 1st, 2009. My purpose for honoring Colonel Lathrop is the fact that he lives in, our, in, in the Placer County community, but he has served so many years protecting us here at home that I feel that this honor was appropriate for him. He's married to Mary Patrice Manning, and they have two daughters. During his military career, Colonel Lathrop served in the demilitarized zone in the Republic of South Korea, participated in both operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, additionally served as a deputy commanding officer for the 40th Corps Support Group deployed to Balad, Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, four from September 2005 to September 2006. Colonel Lathrop became a member of the California Air Na Army National Guard in August 1991. As a full-time member of the Guard, he has seen duty both in the Los Angeles riots, the Northridge earthquake, he commanded Battery A, 3rd Battalion, 144th Field Artillery Regiment during both of these contingency operations. 
Additional assignments include having served as a field artillery battalion, executive officer, field batil uh, artillery battalion, and brigade level adjutant, and as an assistant professor of military science at San Diego State University Army ROTC. Colonel Lathrop commanded the recruiting and retention force for the California Army National Guard, and he has twice served as brigade level plans and operation officer, as most recently as a California Army National Guard Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations D3. Colonel Lathrop has earned two awards for the Bronze Star Medal, five awards for Meritorious Service Medal, seven awards of the Army Accommodation Medal, and three awards of the Army Achievement Medal. He is authorized to wear of shoulder sleeve insignia for former wartime service, the Combat, combat Action Badge, and the Army National Guard Recruiting and Retention Basic Badge. Additionally, he has been awarded the St. Barbara's Medal for having displayed an outstanding degree of competence and high standards of integrity while serving as a field artillery officer of the United States Army. He was born in Bakersfield in 1963. He is a graduate of the University of California, Riverside, with a Bachelor of Arts in Public Service and Political Science. And upon graduation, he was commissioned as second lieutenant in the United States Army Reserve. Colonel Lathrop additionally graduated from the University of Redlands with a master's degree in management. I'd like to just thank him for his service to protecting our country, but most of all, the high standards which he exhibits when he is in public and not only that with his family. And he's just an outstanding individual and it's my great pleasure to give him this award, but also having, I, I can call him friend, thank you. never at a loss for words. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for uh, recognizing all of us today. It's not very often that we enjoy this honor, I'm sure, uh, especially from our elected officials. Our interactions with you are somewhat limited at times. I, I for one, um, take this opportunity to, to thank you and, and to say that it's appreciated. Uh, thank you for your service to our country and uh, God bless you all. Thank you. I did want to, Mark Geyer, our superintendent of the Dry Creek uh, School District is here also. I don't know whether you knew he was here, Diane in the background, but they're back there supporting you. But thank all of you, all of the awardees today, just, uh, it, it's our honor to actually to do this and we appreciate your service, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to 8B. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Linda Oakman with the County Executive Office and with me I have Alison McCrossan who actually put this report together. Um, we're here to ask for um, approval of a resolution accepting the capital facility, uh, Placer County Capital Facilities Impact Fee Annual Report for fiscal year 2008-09. Um, the, the fees were first implemented in 1996 in the, in the unincorporated area and since that time the cities uh, have also agreed to collect the um, capital facilities impact fees. We're required by uh, state law to uh, bring a report to the board um, once a year to uh, let you know how much is in the fund, how much we've collected and, um, and the use of the funds. As of the end of um, June of 2009, the balance in the fund was $52.8 million. <clears throat> All of these funds are, are committed for projects approved in the Capital Facilities Financing Plan. During the year, we collected $3 million in capital and facilities impact fees. Um, this is down from $4 million in 07-08 and down from $7 million in 06-07. Um, and and uh, those fees have been going down uh, on an annual basis since uh, about 2006. Um, 
During the year, $1.8 million was expended for infrastructure associated with the Bill Santucci Justice Center. Each year, um, there is a, a, a provision in the <coughs> uh, adopted ordinance to adjust the fees according to the California CPI for urban consumers from July to July. For this, for this year, for the first time, the CPI was a, a negative, and as a result, the fees uh, went down by 1.4%. The purpose of the fees is to mitigate the impacts of the new development on county capital facilities. Um, so uh, that is, uh, in a nutshell, um, what the report says. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Robert? <clears throat> oh, he left. <laughs> I should have looked down here before. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I take a motion. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll do number nine. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairman Rockwell, members of the board, Richard Connect, Children's System of Care Director. This morning, uh, Health and Human Services seeks your consideration and approval of the attached fiscal year 2009-2010 cooperative agreement between the Placer County Office of Education and the Children's System of Care in the amount of $4,348,618 in order to meet the jointly mandated federal and state mental health mandates to provide services to Placer County children who are identified as having severe emotional disturbance. This unique partnership, first approved by your board four years ago, allows the county to continue efforts to provide the least restrictive and most efficient and effective mental health services possible to these students. These early intervention programs allow staff to deliver services on county school campuses, in com community clinics, and at three special education sites, and effectively prevent long gaps in service delivery and the associated costs uh, to schools and families. Over 70% of the children served in this, um, under this agreement, for, for example, return to their regular school classrooms within two years of starting service, uh, avoiding the, the uh, family and personal stigma of group home or residential care. Under this agreement, waiting lists and service gaps which plague other communities do not exist in Placer County. The net county cost for these services is approximately $15,000. Uh, a budget attachment under item B is included for your consideration and uh, appreciate your consideration of this item. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So can we take both of them together or one at a time? Both, both together. together. Okay. Any questions? I have a motion. Roll call. Montgomery? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Mueller? Aye. Rock home. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Starr? I answered just about anything. <laughs> Before we start, I wanted to just quickly mention, I'm sorry, Joanne Neff's not here. Um, my wife was one of the fortunate few that was able to join one of her Placer County, Placer Grown uh, cookbook dinners and uh, just a few weeks ago, and she hasn't stopped talking about it. So. so we're looking forward to that book coming out. So good morning. Again, I'm Mark Starr, uh, Director of Community Health Clinics and Animal Services. Item 9B before you is to request that you approve acceptance of the grant award from the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This is the Drug-Free Community Support Program. This grant is for coordination of the Coalition for Placer Youth, and it's uh, 125000 per year for five years, so a total of $625,000. We also ask that you authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign any subsequent amendments that uh, might result from, from this grant program. No county general funds are included in this action. A, a little history, uh, and, and starting in early 2007 with uh, some assistance from our Substance Abuse Prevention Program and Community Health, there were a series of town hall forums in the community addressing specifically methamphetamine use in Placer County. And you may recall that one product of these efforts uh, was some methamphetamine prevention DVDs, uh, including one that was youth produced. So a remarkable outcome from, from that effort. Uh, these successful forums also uh, over these last three years have led to a, a desire in the community and among the participants to address broader substance abuse issues uh, affecting Placer County youth, and this led to the creation of the Coalition for Placer Youth. The Coalition 
uh, is made up of uh, really what you might call a grassroots membership, uh, including teachers, principals, uh, leaders in the business community, people in uh, the treatment community, parents, and community volunteers. There's also an advisory board made up of uh, all chiefs of police and, and the cities in the county and uh, the undersheriff, our superintendent of schools, our district attorney, and our chief of probation. So the, the goals of the coalition and really the goals of this grant are to reduce substance abuse among youth by promoting healthy community norms and behavior. Uh, first, by addressing the factors in the community that increase the risk of substance abuse, and second, by promoting those factors that minimize the risk. So about things like decreasing accessibility of, of various drugs, including prescription over-the-counter, and also uh, attitudes and social norms. The second major goal is to establish uh, uh, and strengthen the collaboration among communities, nonprofit agencies, and government that really supports the whole community coalition effort. The coalition, uh, in partnering with our substance abuse prevention program, uh, applied for, and we, basically the coalition submitted the application uh, and needed a fiscal entity like ours to, to be the actual grantee. So applied and, and was awarded this grant, and we are one of 161 communities in the nation selected out of 417 applicants. So it was a competitive process and, and quite a successful application. The vast majority of the funds from this grant are to support local community groups in the areas of outreach, program coordination, and program evaluation. The coalition will reach out to the community to be active participants in assessing youth substance use and root causes of use. It's really prevention oriented. It also will uh, conduct planning, implementation, evaluation, and, and sustaining some of these strategies and partnerships. In Placer County, the grant focuses on reducing youth alcohol use and reducing prescription and over-the-counter drug use, and misuse, I should say, by implementing strategies that uh, affect those behaviors. So there's five subcommittees in the coalition. Uh, the social host subcommittee, which addresses underage alcohol use, the Prescription Over-the-Counter Abuse Subcommittee, uh, which does what it says. And those are the two main focus areas of the coalition. And then there's uh, other subcommittees that include some of our partners, the Placer County Latino Leadership Council Subcommittee, the Placer County Youth Commission that, that you all established last spring, and the Awareness and Media Subcommittee. Some of the coalition's recent successful programs include the Parents Who Host Lose the Most campaign. Uh, you may recall that one uh, began a little over a year ago. That re that's uh, uh, regarding underage alcohol use and the effort to get uh, increased parent awareness about the use of alcohol and, and not to host parties uh, where alcohol might be served is a big push. Another one is uh, What Parents Should Know program that just was really a, a student-run driven educational er efforts for parents to say, you know, wake up and smell the roses kind of uh, program. That was just a few weeks ago. And then last week, the kickoff of this uh, prescription over-the-counter uh, program. So with this grant, the coalition expects many more successes in substance abuse prevention. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Any questions? Seeing none, I'll take a motion. Is that for A and B both? Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, move approval of item 9, B, A, and B. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. We have time to do. Mr. Kratz? Yes. Peter. Good morning. Chairman Rockholm, members of the board, here for Public Works, Peter Kratz, and here to present item 10 for the Auburn Folsom Road Widening Middle Phase Project, asking for your authorization to award the construction contract for that project. Public Works is proposing to construct the middle phase of the Auburn Folsom Road Widening Project with proposed improvements including widening the road from two lanes to four lanes from 1,500 feet north of Oak Hill Drive intersection to 1,500 feet south of the Eureka Road intersection, which is about 0.8 mile, and replace the San Juan Water District water line through the project area. Construction is scheduled to begin in spring 2010 and will take two construction seasons to complete, uh, including tree removal, which is, should start soon, uh, that will need to get done sometime between now and February. As you've heard in, I think, pre previous items today, the bid climate for capital projects is, is still very good. 
Uh, with this uh, advertisement, we had nine bidders competing with bids ranging from four point, just under $4.3 million to $5.9 million, with the low bidder awarded to Western Engineering with their low bid at, uh, again, just over or just under $4.3 million. The engineer's estimate was $7.1 million, so a substantial savings in the, uh, the bid for this project. Environmentally, uh, the project has been cleared for, from both federal and state environmental regulations for NEPA and CEQA. And fiscally, the cost of the contract, again, $4.3 million. Other costs uh, for management, design, and right-of-way uh, total the project at $6.25 million, with funds stemming from $760,000 from the San Juan Water District to replace the water line. And then federal funding from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, totaling just over $2 million. And then our Granite Bay traffic impact fees of just under $3 million, $2.88 million. And then prior board action allowing us to use countywide traffic impact fees in the amount of $4.5 million as a loan. We only need uh, just over $500,000 because of the savings on this particular bid. So I'll answer that question real quick because I know it'll come. The ability to move forward on our north phase looks pretty good. The, the big challenge with the North Phase project will be right-of-way acquisition. We have three property property owners that have been difficult to uh, acquire the right-of-way. But that's once we get through that, uh, the funding will look pretty good for delivering that project uh, as a future project. So with that, uh, I'll summarize by asking you to adopt a resolution authorizing the Chairman of the Board of Supervisors to award and execute the construction contract with County Council and Risk Management Review and Approval for the Opera and Folsom Road Widening Middle Phase Project to the lowest responsible and responsive bidder, Western Engineering, for just under $4.3 million and authorize our Director of Public Works to execute contract change orders in the amount of 10 percent of the contract amount if deemed necessary. Happy to answer any questions I like the you might look have. that Ken just got in his face when he, he authorized, we'd authorize him to sign that check. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Kurt. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank Public Works for their diligence not only moving this project forward but in, in keeping the community informed um, as this project is developed obviously very impactful one of the two main arteries going through the granite barrier and one that seems to be the most uh, uh, heavily impacted uh, at this point and they have been fantastic about coming to the MAC keeping folks informed as to what's going on um, soliciting community input all throughout the process and just been just been great to work with on this project so I just wanted to thank you for your efforts Thank you. You want to make a motion? Well, I was going to see if any board members had any questions. I, mean, I would on. be more than happy to move approval. Oh, right, yeah. Motion, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You're good to go. Thank you very much. We're going to take up the last regular business item, and we're going to adjourn as the Placer County Board of Supervisors and reconvene as the Placer County Redevelopment Agency and take up item uh, number 11. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the item before you today is uh, regarding uh, the redevelopment agency owned 6.2 acre site on Silver Bend Way, which we acquired last year uh, as a result of a settlement of a, uh, with a previous owner who was in default on an agency loan. The site is in within the North Auburn Redevelopment Project area and is vacant and zoned for multifamily residential use. Since acquiring the site, the agency has a co coordinated activities of the sheriff, county code enforcement, CAL FIRE, and private contractors to make improvements, including uh, grading emergency improved access for emergency vehicles and removing substantial amounts of trash, debris, brush, which was a fire hazard, and several homeless encampments. On May 26, 2009, your board authorized the agency to release a request for proposals for finding a developer for the site. Uh, we received four proposals in response to that RFP uh, from USA Properties Fund, Pacific West Companies, Auburn Eco Housing, and Community Housing Opportunities. The proposals were rated based on the following criteria. Demonstrated successful development experience and capability of the teams. Demonstrated financial knowledge and capability. 
quality of the proposals and compatibility with the agency's goals. As a result of this process, USA Properties Fund is recommended for selection. They are proposing to develop and manage approximately 65 rental housing units at varying levels of affordability on the site. USA has extensive experience planning, constructing, and operating successful housing projects, totaling more than 10,000 dwelling units, and including several projects in Placer County and the greater Sacramento area. The proposed action before you is to select a USA Properties Fund team and authorize the Chief Assistant CEO Redevelopment Director to execute an exclu exclusive negotiating rights agreement, or ENRA, for development of the agency property. The ENRA would obligate the agency to negotiate exclusively with the USA team for 180 days with the intended result of reaching agreement on a disposition and development agreement, or DDA, to set terms for disposition of the agency land and the financing, implementation, and operation of the project. The ENRA would authorize the Chief Assistant CEO Redevelopment Director to extend the agreement for another 180 days if both parties uh, felt that this was in their interest. The RFP advertised that the agency would consider offering the 6.2 acre site as well as up to $2 million of agency financing from housing set aside bond proceeds for development of a desirable project. However, uh, the agreement that you uh, have before you does not obligate the agency to provide the land for any specific price or provide any specific funding. The, the project is not yet defined. We will work that out during the course of negotiations and running the project through the planning process. The financial and project terms will be negotiated by the parties and spelled out in a DDA, which will come before your board at the end of this process. Uh, I'll, that concludes my presentation, but I will point out that uh, Brandon Dinan, Brandon, you want to raise your hand? of USA Properties is also here to, if you have any questions for them. Any questions? Anyone in the audience wish to comment on this item? I'll bring it back to the board. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. We will now adjourn as the Redevelopment Agency Board and reconvene as the Flash County Board of Supervisors and take up our timed item at 11 o'clock and ask our superintendent of schools, Gil Garbolino Mojica, to come forward. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Rockham and members of the Placer County Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm here with my annual requirement to report to you of the status of the Williams schools. Those are schools within our county that are scoring on the academic performance index, the measure set by the state of California, uh, to rank uh, schools as part of their uh, performance. Uh, and schools that are ranked in a decile one, two, or three are considered Williams schools and are subject to additional scrutiny and oversight and accountability by the county superintendent as set forth in Education Code 1240C. So with that, um, I don't know how to advance. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, schools that are subject to the Williams, as I mentioned earlier, are based uh, on their academic performance index uh, score of 1 through 10. Uh, each school in the state of California is given a number. Uh, schools that are ranked 1, 2, or 3 are considered low performing and therefore Williams schools. Uh, these Williams schools were selected in 2006 based upon the 2006 testing that happened that spring and are subject to this increased accountability for three years. We are ending our third year of this cycle for these schools in our county. Uh, and this spring, the students uh, across state of California will be taking the standardized test again and they will be rebenching. Uh, the Williams schools based upon the progress and the achievement of students this spring. So two things could happen next year. Either I could be here reporting on uh, the same or additional Williams schools, or if everything goes well, I won't be here next year because we won't have any Williams schools and we're hoping for the latter. Uh, basically what we have to do in the four, first four weeks of schools is we have to uh, count uh, and make sure that there are sufficient, sufficient 
standardized uh, standards based excuse me textbooks in each of the classrooms at these schools we have to report on the conditions of the facilities meaning that they're safe and clean we have to uh, determine if the accuracy on the school accountability report card is accurate and we have to review teacher credentials to make sure that the teachers who are in the classroom are appropriately credentialed to teach the class that they are assigned so with that we do have three schools uh, in the Placer County that are Williams schools these three schools we've reported now uh, three years in a row they are four Forest Hill High School in the Placer Union High School District, Kings Beach Elementary in the Tahoe Truckee Unified School District, and First Street School that's in the Western Placer Unified School District. So briefly here, Forest Hill High School, we found that they did have indeed uh, sufficient instructional materials, that their school site was in good repair, that the information on their school accountability report card was accurate. However, they did have five teacher misassignments, meaning five of their staff members were teaching a course uh, or a section that they were not properly credentialed, and so they had uh, that required uh, that school district to take that uh, action to the board and the board did rectify by passing a resolution stating that these teachers were uh, credentialed or meet a specific standard so they could teach in that assignment for for that year so that met all of our criteria for Forest Hill uh, in Kings Beach, um, there were some mat instructional material deficiencies, uh, but they were remedied within the first couple of weeks. This is something that we've seen uh, over the course of three years. Every year it seems as if to be a challenge to find whenever we have staff members that go up there that the, each classroom does have sufficient textbooks for every single child in that classroom. So we continue to work with Kings Beach Elementary on that. The school site was in good repair. Uh, the information on the school accountability, accountability report card was accurate, and there was only one teacher misassignment which was rectified recently by the board by passing a resolution in determining that that teacher was in fact uh, able to teach in that class. And lastly, First Street School, uh, they had sufficient instructional materials. <coughs> their school site was in good repair. Their information on their school accountability report card was accurate, and there were no teacher misassignments. So with that, that's the conclusion of my report, and I'll take any questions if you, you have any. questions? Okay. Uh, Jennifer. I, I, sorry, I probably missed this because I stepped out of the room. In terms of having sufficient instructional materials, textbooks mm -hmm. specifically, what is the state regulation? That each child has access to uh, their adopted curriculum, and it, that it be standards-based. So, for example, in the state of California, there are two publishers in the area of English language arts that you can adopt, Open Court, or uh, I believe it's Hoopla Mifflin. And so you need to be able, every student in that class, in that school, needs to have their own textbooks. You can't partner share a textbook. If there's a workbook, every student has to have a workbook. And those books have to be available to go home with the student. So um, the, 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 the criteria for us is where was the resolution that the board passed adopting the standards-based uh, textbooks, what were uh, the textbooks or the number of workbooks and supplemental materials that were passed, and does every child in that school have that their own personal set of their textbooks? And the, that's K through 12? It would be K through 12, but with Kings Beach, it's K through 5th. Right. It's an elementary school. Right. Um, are photocopies of instructional materials sufficient, or does no. it have to be a textbook? It has to be a textbook. It has to be the publisher's material. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very thank you. much. And we'll see what happens this spring when I'll be back next fall. Well, you can come back and see us. Okay. I'll come any back anytime. Reason. I will do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And we got a couple of minutes on this. Yeah, we can get started. Okay. We'll start with the 1115. I think all interested parties are here. Good morning. And I wanted to thank you. You did a nice job with the awards. It was my honor to do it. We, we we can't share this material. We all have to have our own material. You bet. We just need one, right? Go ahead. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Therese Leonard with the Executive Office. I'm joined today by Ann Craig, our Personnel Services Manager and Benefit Expert. And we are here today to talk to you about the pension actuarial that we received from CalPERS. And after we go through the actuarial detail, we'd like to talk a little bit about the DSA retiree and industrial disability um, topic that we talked about about a month ago at, during the health presentation. Placer County has been a member of the pension platform with CalPERS since 1949. So we're a veteran, we've been there a long time. We have two plans, one is the safety plan and one is the miscellaneous plan. The higher the percentage, the greater the benefit. The safety plan is 3% at 50. It was approved by the Board of Supervisors back in 2002. There are currently 823 participants. Participants are active, retiree, separated from county employment, and transfers. In other words, they have um, platforms under other CalPERS that they've moved to. They've separated employment with the county. There are 430 active safety members. The miscellaneous plan is 2.5 at age 55. There are over 5,000 participants, about 2,400 active, 1,700 retirees. That plan was adopted back in 2004 by the board. In order to be retirement eligible, an employee must be at least age 50 or greater and have five years of CalPERS service credit, and that could be with any agency. The way the formula calculates for retirement, it's a benefit factor times the number of years of service times the 12, highest 12 months of PERSable compensation. The benefit factor is important because it relates to the type of plan. Safety, again, 3% at 50. They immediately receive the benefit of 3% at age 50 and onward. Whereas in the miscellaneous group, it's 2.5% at age 55. It starts, because they are eligible to retire at age 50, it starts at 2% and then gradually gets to 2.5 when they turn age 55. Perceivable compensation is wages, you know, typical regular salary, vacation leave paid, holiday leave paid, but it also includes special pays or certificates like post, um, wellness, um, uh, architectural certifications and things of that nature uniform allowance, Tahoe incentives, all that is included in the calculation for personal compensation. What is not included is overtime. So if we were going to look at an example of what benefit gets paid out to an employee if they were going to retire today, the average wages that are being earned for miscellaneous active employees is 60421 If they were age 55 and had been here for 20 years, their annual benefit would be $30,000. The average wage for a safety member is $71,000. Again, it includes all those built up for post and wellness and other kinds of um, special compensation. Same time, 3%. 20 years of service, age 55, and that benefit would be $42,000 a year. The way the county funds the pension program is determined by a CalPERS actuarial report that is completed every year. And how much we charge through our payroll process is told to us by this actuarial report. The report that we just received the valuation is two years in arrears of the date that we actually are going to use the calculation. So all the data that you're going to be hearing about today dates back to June 30th, 2008, and it's being used for the payroll or budget process for 1011. The safety rate for the employer portion of the CalPERS rate is a little over 24%. The miscellaneous is estimated at 15%. Included in the actuary is an estimate for next year. And it's just an estimate. It is subject to change when we get the report a year from now. But right now they're estimating that the rates will go up. In addition to the employee share, employer share, there is an employee component. And for the um, 
miscellaneous plan, I went backwards, miscellaneous plan, it is currently at 8%. So for every dollar of PERS compensation paid, 8% is set aside for the employee share. Over a series of years, the Board of Supervisors agreed to phase in a pickup of that employee share. So instead of it being paid by the employee, the employer picked it up. Starting back in 1986, it was 3.25%, and it gradually increased until 1999, where it was 7%. In 2004, the platform for the pension program changed. It went to 2.5% <coughs> at 55, from a 2% at 55 platform. And so when that happened, the benefit share went from 7% to 8%. As part of the agreement, employees pick up that additional 1%. There are different nuances um, that you'll see little notations throughout this presentation because different groups have little pieces that are a little special and so I've noted them versus speaking to them formally. The safety plan had the same type of phase in arrangement for the employee share. Back in 1987 the county picked up 3.25% that was gradually increased over, over a decade to the point where in 2000 the county picked up 9%. And then again, some of the nuances in the arrangement, correctional officers um, went to a safety platform for their retirement. When they did that, they agreed to pick up a larger share of the percentage pickup. So the county pays 6.5 and they pick up 2.5. Did I add that right? Thank you. Um, DSA safety um, very recently um, are picking up 2.5% with the county paying 6.5 and probation officers as part of the agreement that was reached over a year ago will begin to um, pick up 2% of their safety retirement. As you can see from this chart, which is very colorful, um, this only speaks to the piece that is paid for by the county not the employee pickup that they're actually paying out. If you look back to the years when the two platforms were approved, the 2002 safety and the 2004 miscellaneous, the rates were very low at that time. And so when it was agreed to by the board, you know, essentially they weren't picking up that much. Since that time, however, the rates have gone up. And that's due to a number of factors. Payroll increases, participant increases, um, asset valuation, investment return, so a whole bunch of different things. The blue line includes the safety employer share as well as what we've agreed to pick up from the for the employee over time. If we had not agreed to pick up the 9% for safety, it would be the red line, which is significantly lower. And the same goes for the miscellaneous plan. The pink line represents our share as an employer, as well as what we've agreed to pick up for the employee, and the green line is what it would have been if we hadn't agreed to do that. Again, the plan um, contains over 5,000 members for miscellaneous and 800 for safety, and over a series of eight years, um, each has grown about 40%. Plan participation, um, again, it's made up of various active, retired, and other, other being transferred or separated employees. All the participants in this chart show growth, and I expect that we'll continue to see that over the next several decades. The other thing that has occurred is that over the last eight years, our payroll has grown, and that's um, in relationship to salary increases number of active employees that have joined our workforce that has grown our employee base. Our active average pay hasn't grown as fast. So you can see that a lot of the growth has been related to additions of employees versus payroll growth. And then the retiree average benefit has also grown significantly. And that's because when we went to a different platform, they get a better benefit rate. The safety average annual pension benefit is about $32,000 a year. 
Um, you have three different um, categories there, service retirement, industrial disability, as well as all categories, and that includes um, death, non-industrial disability, and things of that nature. So the average for all is on the very far right. The average age for a safety retiree is 60. It's relatively young. The average age for a safety active is 39, also very young. About 74% of our active workforce in the safety plan is under the age of 45. When we look at the miscellaneous plan, you can see that the average benefit is significantly lower at $14,000 a year. Same representation, the average age for the miscellaneous retiree is 67, and the average age for the active is 47. 74% of our actives are over the age of 45. Funding strategy. Every year through the budget process, we plan for and recognize the obligation as indicated in the actuarial report. Over the last several years, we have contributed millions of dollars towards this benefit. It's grown almost $9 million in the last what, four years. And this is just a pictorial representation of that. Um, these are not in addition to, they are part of. So essentially the blue line is the county budget in its entirety, and as a subsection, the red and the green are public safety fund and general fund components of that. Whoops. So with any actuarial report, it's a very fluid document, and it's gonna change from year to year. It's particularly gonna change from this year, the one we just got, to next year. Um, it is point in time. It takes your active re employee base, your retiree base, and it factors in through a whole bunch of assumptions evaluation. It includes a 7.75% investment return. My portfolio didn't receive, earned 7.75% this year. So the next report I think that we're gonna get is gonna be a little bit lower. It also factors in a 3% cost uh, CPI a 3.25% payroll increase each year, and so that's how they get their assumptions built in. It also includes a 15-year smoothing on gains and losses, and that does affect um, the volatility, if you will, of the employer rate, or at least it was supposed to. So as we look at the safety actuary, the liability is currently $217 million. The key to this piece is that one of the largest growth components of that liability relates to retirees. So of the $18 million in growth, $12 million is related to retiree additions. The other piece of this is the value of the assets. The value as stated on this report is the actuarial value. And it leads to the unfunded liability. In the safety plan, it's now $54 million. This year, funded status is 76%. And I will say that the calculation to get the funded status is not on the actuarial value of assets, it's on the market value of assets. And so for the last two years, that number has been higher, which is why the funded amount is higher. In the miscellaneous group, similar depiction in the last year, the liability has grown $63 million. The largest component of that relates to retirees and about 50% for active employees. Assets are about $541 million with an unfunded liability of $126 million. Again, that one's funded at about 82%. That's a very good number compared to what you're gonna see in a minute. So our total unfunded liability is about $181 million for both plans. That represents a $21 million growth in the liability year over year. So looking forward, also included in the actuary that we received from CalPERS was a statement that indicated that from June 30th, 2008 through June 30th, 2009, they experienced a 28% investment 
loss. That's huge. If we took our assets, I'm taking the actuarial value of assets, and took 28%, that would be $197 million that we lost during that year. It's a lot of money. As a result of that, CalPERS is representing another smoothing technique so that agencies would not see a 10 to 15% increase in their rates in one year. They're going to phase it in over a series of five years. And the rates will go anywhere from a little bit less than 1% all the way up to 2.6% each year, and it's cumulative. What does that mean to our budget? It's significant. We're looking at a 36% growth in the cost of our pension over the next five years just from this smoothing. This does not factor in any other changes in the portfolio as the years go by. This is just based on June 30th, 2009 information. What does that look like? It's just going up, up and up. So with that, I'll take any questions. Kurt, <coughs> are they, is CalPERS providing guidance for uh, 910, do they do that? Do they provide any, I mean, publicly traded entities have to provide annual guidance as to what we think we're going to do next year. Does CalPERS do that? Do they provide any kind of guidance? In other words, we, we experienced a 28% loss in the value of our investments with CalPERS. Correct. And Are they providing any kind of guidance for next year? Do they see, do they tell you we think it's going to be a loss of this or gain of that? Well, um, in terms of this report that we just received, we will be using that for the 10-11 budget cycle. What they're estimating for the 11-12 was the 28% portfolio hit, and that's, um, if we look back at the rates that we were just talking about, um, we're looking at gradually increasing our rates each year by up to 2% a year. Right, no, I understand, but that's reflective of the of a previous loss. They are doing that because of an 089 loss correct. of 28% of the portfolio value, correct? So what I'm saying is as they look ahead to 910, do they provide any kind of guidance that says we think in 910 we will have port po portfolio performance of X and therefore, that translates. In other words, we're going to continue to see uh, a, a, a diminishment of our existing assets, or do they think we've stabilized and a 910 is going to rebound and come up? And Craig, uh, personnel services manager, uh, at, the recent, at the recent CalPERS educational forum, basically they're looking at the investment gains from this year are approximately 10.4%. Um, obviously, they don't have a crystal ball and can tell us we're all going to get 10.4, which is, is obviously then again three, almost 3% 3 full above the actuarial assumption. The actuarial assumptions are all under review again, be, part of it, partly in response to this l big economic loss now, but it is also their, they review all the assumptions every th three years to make sure that they're still falling in line and to go forward. So they're taking all that into consideration and looking at what's coming down the pike. Um, Ron Sealing, who is the chief actuary for CalPERS, um, realizes that you know public agencies and the, as well as the state are in very difficult financial situations. And part of the reason they've gone to this secondary uh, rate smoothing method was to try and play out the best way to still make sure that CalPERS obviously had the money to pay the benefits, and they still stand on their word saying they still have the money to pay the benefits that they will go, but they realize it is that it will have to be paid for in the future on the liabilities. Um, so from that, I mean, that's part of what they're looking for. They run actuarial evaluations, and they look at changing any of their assumptions, whether it's the investment assumption, the payroll growth, and or uh, benefit assumptions, uh, they look at how all those fall into place and run a variety of different scenarios on how to play those out. To come up to this last one, they ran like 1,500 scenarios, try to look at how it would affect various different agencies across the board. 
Um, we have what are called low volatility indexes for our actuarial, um, which is a, a good thing. It's a uh, payroll over assets and how that index is rated. But there are some agencies like uh, Long Beach that have extremely high ones that their volatility is really going to be very difficult, even with the rates moving to come into play. So they're not going to give you a crystal ball and say, yeah, we're going to make 12 percent this year. But Right. You know, I, I, part of my concern is driven by the fact that I know that CalPERS got fairly heavily invested in the commercial real estate market, and we're just now starting to see the impacts in the commercial real estate market that we've been experiencing the last year and a half in the residential real estate market. And you know, I think what's important for us to remember, just for easy math, say that our total asset value before the drop was $100 million. It was 30 percent. You lost $30 million. You're now down to $70 million. So you gain 10 percent. You're not gaining back 10 million. You're gaining back 7 million. So you're only been gaining back a quarter of what you originally lost when you lost the 30, $30 million. Correct. And CalPERS is, is looking at those same types of scenarios when they put these together and looking at how, you know, what it will take for them to come back to 100 percent funding. They anticipate um, probably next year being at, uh, across the board at approximately 60 percent funding by the time this is all applied. 60%. 60. Yeah. Yeah. The calculation I did would put us about 57%. Oh, I mean, there are other pieces of the puzzle when you look at some of the actuarial information is that, you know, it's a long, you know, I mean, it's, it's similar to what we always hear with our own retirement stuff. It's long-term investment. You have to be going for the long haul and, and looking at that. But they look at it as an ongoing life perpetual fund that, that will all outlive us. And, which is obviously the goal, but. Robert. Uh, <clears throat> connected to that, um, I don't know the dynamics of the smoothing, the cost smoothing formula, but I guess my question is with such a dramatic decrease in the CalPERS valuation, is it such that, uh, is the formula, so obviously it's building in lag times so that you don't have to accommodate such a dramatic decrease in the total asset value in any particular period, year. Mm -hmm. um, so is the drop so dramatic that for the foreseeable future uh, you expect increases in contribution requirements or do you know or I mean it just seems that might would be a simplified, yeah, I've got the spreadsheet yeah. I'm looking at. If you look at slide 27, that actually represents what I believe we would need to pay as we go through the next five years based on the five-year smoothing that they're introducing. And because it's a cumulative formula that they're saying, you know, like 0.8 percent the first year and 1.7 percent the second year and 2 percent the third year, it's cumulative. And so essentially your rate goes up to like 30-something percent just for the employer's share, and when it's factored as a percent of payroll, it's significant. So we're looking at probably $15 million increase in the cost of our pension over the next five years. And I guess, yeah, it sounds like you've thought through that pretty well. The, the, a way to see relief from that would be if we had a 28 percent decrease in asset valuation last year, if it immediately recovered uh, in this next year, then you'd sort of be at the same starting point. You'd be back at square one. By the time we actually see that, it won't be till the 12-13 um, budget year. Well, half then. Um, it depends. We read a lot about CalPERS and their real estate investments of various types, and yeah. everybody has their own crystal ball, I guess. But um, I guess if you make the assumption, and it sounds like we have thought through that, that the 28 percent drop is going to take at least a significant amount of time from which to recover, uh, it doesn't really matter with a smoothing formula. Um, still going to have to be catching up on that smoothing formula o over time unless that 20 percent decrease was recovered in a very short period of time. Absolutely Thanks. right. Jennifer. Thank you, Therese. Um, I wanted to get back to slides 23 and 24 <clears throat> and make sure I understand what I'm really seeing there in terms of the unfunded liability portions. Um, the, the miscellaneous 
Okay, we'll start with safety. Um, the safety unfunded liability, June 30th, 2008, 54 million 620 and change. That's for 823, the 823 employees who are on that program. It's for the 823 participants, some of which are active and some are retired and. Right, okay. And then on the next slide, uh, the unfunded liability is a, you know, 126 million 357 and change. That's for 5,325 participants. That is correct. So clearly the unfunded liability per employee is substantially larger for the safety employees than for miscellaneous. Maybe there's not an easy answer to my question, but why? I would say it probably has a lot to do with the formula. 3% okay. of 50 is a very generous benefit. Um, the other component to that is the number of retirees that went out. Um, a large number of the group, was it 277 that are retired, mm -hmm. a significant portion went out in the last five to eight, ten years. Okay. It, it just didn't seem that the half a percent difference in the five years would be yeah, that appreciatively different, but I don't have my calculator with me, so. Yeah, it's also based, I mean, when you look at the the uh, demographics for the group, it's also based upon the salary increases, and um, the CalPERS actuary feels that the salary increases, salary and growth are really almost 50% of what you're looking at in terms of your impact on your rates. Uh, the change in the platforms, they've analyzed it down to approximately 25%, and then you have other changes that uh, may have come through in terms of, you know, People are obviously living longer, which I think is one of the ones that they will certainly be looking at again uh, when they do their actuarial assumptions and how those play together. Uh, how many people are coming into your plan and or the state plans and what age, um, because historically they're all a little bit older. So you have all those plays in there as well. But yes, it is a, it is a higher benefit that's in that plan. Does, doesn't, the, doesn't the industrial piece of that, though, because of the amount of industrial injuries that comes along with safety. That's true, too. And then most, you know, most officers that retire, deputies that retire, at, at, with 20 years at age 50 or what beyond, the average lifespan is only seven years. Mm -hmm. And so they collect, I think Actually, that's Actually, we, we did do some research on that because it was um, a topic that came up in the conversation back in October. And based on all the information that we've been able to glean, the um, insurance companies do not recognize officers in any distinct difference than the average person. So the life expectancy for an officer is actually the same as it would be for any of us. In addition to that, um, they aren't even listed in the top 10 most dangerous jobs. You know, in, firefighters get it. Yeah. So, you know, essentially, I can't find any statistics that actually support that they have a younger life expectancy. The CalPERS actuary uses the same mortality table for miscellaneous as they do for safety. Um, and the other um, factor that may be relevant to use uh, Supervisor Montgomery is the average age for the safety retiree is only 60. That's very young, and if the life expectancy is in 70s, 80s, 90s, that's a long time to be funding um, a significant pension. If you recall, the pension that safety receives is like three times the size of miscellaneous. That's the other component to the size of the unfunded liability. Well, and it, as I was just going to add that we, it is the cumulative effect of, of the half a percent five years earlier. But when you're multiplying it against a cost basis, it's 17 and a half percent higher. The average cost of, to, to, of employee is 17 and a half percent higher in safety than it is, than it is in miscellaneous. So it, the cumulative effect of that half a percent at five years earlier plus that higher basis is, is really what, what kicks that up. Thank you for that. Um, if there's no further questions, we can go on to the second portion of the presentation, um, which has to do with the DSA 8020 health cost sharing. Um, back in October, your board approved a short-term stipend be paid to DSA retirees that met certain criteria. 
um, to help them transition to the new 80-20 cost sharing formula. At that time, your board asked us to go back and research how many industrial disability retirees would not be eligible for that benefit because they either retire prior to the year 2000 or they had less than 10 years Placer County um, service. At this point, we believe there's about six um, retired industrial disability retired uh, folks who would not be eligible, um, four of which ret um, retired prior, or is it eight? Eight. eight. Six retired prior to 2002 had less than 10 years of experience with the county. What we would like to recommend to your board is that we allow these through exception to participate in the short-term stipend. The same rules would apply in that if they retire after the June 30th, 2009 date, they would not be eligible, but otherwise um, we would pay them the same stipend through the June 30th, 2010 date. Any questions? I think there's some folks here that want to talk, so. Well, I'll open it up for comment. May we please have your name and address? <clears throat> if you're talking for the group, I'll allow you a little bit more time. If, if the other's going to speak, we'd like, like you to keep it three minutes, please. Okay. Um, Ken Mackold, Auburn, California. Um, we, we do have a group now that has been authorized by DSA retirees. Um, I'm one of them. Um, let, me, let me just get back for a second on the study for the mortality rate of peace officers. Um, I was part of three negotiations for uh, DSA um, back a long time ago, and <laughs> uh, that study was done by Stanford. I will find it. I'll get you all a copy. Um, that study came up in at least two of the negotiations with the county and um, that was considered for the benefits that DSA has today. So I will get that for you. Um, also on safety retirement, uh, PERS sets all the rules and regulations for safety retirement. Uh, DSA didn't negotiate for the safety retirement conditions. DSA re negotiated for the different formulas that uh, safety retirement offers. And just for a little background, the 3% at 50 uh, Placer County DSA was one of the last groups to get that. Most of the surrounding agencies already had the 3% at 50 or the old CHP formula. But anyway, um, the retired group um, is, is happy with the, the stipend that um, Mr. Miller has uh, recommended and the board approved. Um, as far as the, the disability, uh, officers on disability, they didn't have a choice in that. Uh, if they wanted to um, work for Placer County, they weren't given the opportunity because of their disability that happened on the job. So to, to punish someone that, that doesn't have 10 years because of their disability, I think is wrong. Plain and simple. Um, the the ten year requirement uh, for people coming in from other agencies, I agree with. Uh, where the county requires someone to have ten years, no problem there. But if if you didn't make the ten years because you were disabled, because you were serving the county, um, I think you need to take a look at that. I think that's what you're off you're you're recommending the eight. Um, yes, Chairman Rockham. Um, essentially, our recommendation is that we override that exception for the industrial disability retirees, whether or not they retired prior to 2000 or had less than 10 years of experience. Yeah, we do appreciate that. I was going mainly by what was printed on the uh, on the agenda item, but I heard the difference. <laughs> Believe me, that is appreciated. So, um, any questions of? The retired group? I don't see any. Um, just, just for your information, we, we are going to be uh, meeting uh, with your representatives to 
try and work out some kind of a long-term uh, health benefit, and um, that, that's our goal. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? All right, I'll bring it back to the board. So I guess the action you want us to take is to approve, to modify <clears throat> our earlier decision with the eight and include the eight. Um, yes, I'd appreciate that. And then what we'll do with the next board meeting is bring a resolution that includes both actions for your board's approval. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, um, appreciate the ongoing effort by the CEO's office to educate our board and the public in general as to how structurally we're looking at a problem that um, right now I don't know that I see a way out of. And uh, uh, with a combination of the um, uh, the health benefits discussion that we had previously and the pension benefits discussion that we're just having today, and I'm sure we will look forward to more reports going forward. Um, it, it, I think, lays a good foundation, a good framework for what uh, we all, uh, this board as well as the various bargaining units, uh, need to have our eyes open to as we go into next year and sit down and try to figure out how uh, we keep the faith with our employees while keeping our county economically viable. Uh, so appreciate this workshop. Look forward to receiving more information as we move forward. Um, and then we'll also move that we go ahead and uh, adopt staff's recommendation to provide for the stipend for the phasing into the cost share formula for the, that group identified. That goes enough. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And Therese and Ann, thank you <clears throat> for your work and especially helping work with the retirees. And, you know, that's, that's the best way is to share information and, and, and work together. All right, that's it with the exception of closed session. The board will now take up the items on page three of its agenda, <laughs> item 12. There are two litigation matters. And labor discussions, while in closed session, the board will adjourn as the board and convene as the Placer County In-Home Supportive Services Public Authority to do, also do labor um, discussions, and we will report back later. Okay, we, we are adjourned. <laughs>